This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation. The Nigel Farage Show. Good morning, everybody. Well, of course, I know what you're all talking about. It's not politics or current affairs. It's not Brexit or defence or immigration. It's the weather, isn't it? Uh, because for the seventh day, fires are raging across Lancashire moorlands now. Two major outbreaks outside Bolton. I have to say, I went to watch a bit of cricket yesterday afternoon and the outfield reminded me of 1976 when Viv Richards at the Oval scored 300 runs in about two sessions. Are we heading for another 1976 and a severe drought? We'll ask John Ketley about that later on in the show. Uh, we'll also talk at 11 o'clock about the forthcoming NATO summit. I know it's not much in the news at the moment, but believe me, I think with Trump's trip to the NATO summit, coming to visit the UK to meet the Queen, and then, of course, off to Helsinki to meet Vladimir Putin, I think the NATO summit has the potential to be quite an explosive event, as Trump basically says to European countries, either you start paying up or you can forget about being protected by America. What is Britain's role in all of this? Yesterday was Armed Forces Day and the Prime Minister refused to commit to us staying as a tier one nation. Is this because defence doesn't matter? So I'll ask you at 11, do you think defence is still an important issue? But for now, well, I was at the European summit on Thursday and Friday. And surprisingly, uh, Brexit was about fourth on the agenda because the European Union have got much bigger problems than Brexit to deal with, namely the incoming Italian government who threatened to just veto everything unless there was some form of words agreed as to what to do with the migrant crisis, those coming in from across the Mediterranean. A form of words was cobbled together that on a voluntary basis countries could set up onshore centres, but with absolutely no commitment from any other country to genuinely help Italy with the numbers. Um, and they all went away saying they had a great deal, and within 12 hours it fell to bits. So the Italian government, I don't think, really very happy. Mrs Merkel still surviving, but I think it's just a question of time. So Brexit didn't really feature very heavily. But Mr Barnier, repeating as he often does that the clock is ticking, which you know what, he's right, because we're supposed to have reached an agreement by October. That's the deadline, because thereafter, whatever the deal is, needs to be ratified by all the other member state parliaments, and ultimately by the European Parliament too. And you know what happens in Brussels in the summer? Well, I can tell you, I've been there 19 years. The whole place closes down for about four weeks. So really, the amount of negotiating time we've got left uh, is very very limited. And that against the backdrop of a meeting that will take place at Chequers on Friday with the entire cabinet. Um, I'm not sure exactly of the numbers, but I think it's something like now 13 Remainers and now eight Leavers, a couple of switch sides to leave. Um, and questions, genuine questions being asked about Mrs May's authority as leader. Is she going to survive? Are the Brexiteers brave enough to even think about trying to get rid of her? Well, to help me go through this puzzle and work out where we're going to be this time next week, I guess it is anybody's guess, but hey, George Parker, political editor at the Financial Times, joins me this morning. George, good morning. 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 So the European summit, really from a Brexit point of view, anything that stands out for you? Well, I mean, as you say, it was a sort of very much a lower order issue yeah. at the summit. It sort of discussed over the, the coffees or the putty fours, wasn't it, over dinner on the Friday, and then they moved on to more serious stuff. I thought there was an interesting thing in the council communique at the end, which was inserted at the request of the Brits, which was a suggestion that if Britain uh, blurs its red lines, if Theresa May budges a bit, the EU might improve its offer. I think that's important because what Theresa May, I think, will try and do at this meeting at Chequers that you mentioned later in the week is basically budge Britain's position in a sense to try and unblock these uh, negotiations, which frankly have been going nowhere for the last six months. And would that be seen then, George, uh, as her trying to get cabinet agreement on Friday to what perhaps nowadays we term as a soft Brexit? Yeah, she's definitely moving in that direction. Members of the cabinet have been told that it's going to be heading in that direction. And some of the red lines that have been there for the best part of two years are going to have to be blurred. Now, that's going to be a tough sell, of course, as, as you know, uh, Nigel. I mean, Boris Johnson, will he walk out? Will David Davis walk out? 
or will they, having huffed and puffed as they have done in the past, basically swallow the whole thing? So that's the big question. But I think, you know, on issues like, for example, staying in the customs union or something like it for a bit longer, staying in the single market for goods, probably by a different name, maybe accepting a bit more a few more rulings from the European Court of Justice, mm. all those things, I think, are basically on the table. And what about free movement of people, this great issue that had the country convulsed during the referendum campaign? Yeah, I mean, this suggestion that uh, Number 10 is going to have to blur the red line on that as well, I think that's incredibly difficult for the government to do. You know, if you think what were people really voting on mm. um, last, in yeah. 2016, it was the, the NHS dividend on the side of that bus, but I think primarily it was about free movement. So I don't think the government is going to move on this now. I think there's a, a review of migration policy which will run through till September. But I think in the end, you know, how much is Britain prepared to trade in exchange for a good trade deal with the EU? And is free movement one of the things that in the end will be part of the end game? I don't know. I think at the end, Theresa May will have to have established some kind of control over her borders. Otherwise, people will start to ask, well, what was the point? Well, even without that, I mean, if we stay in a single market uh, for goods and, and, and a customs union for a number of years, I mean, that presumably comes a point when David Davis, Boris Johnson, Michael Gove say this isn't really Brexit at all. Yeah, I think that's true. Uh, and and I, think, I think you've made the point, haven't you, that uh, you end up so far away from the kind of Brexit that you had in yeah. mind that actually would we be better off staying in? Now, nobody's saying that publicly, of course, on the, in, in the Cabinet. But you're right. I mean, is there a certain point where they, where they say this is just not good enough and they walk out? I think Boris Johnson is on resignation watch in 10 Downing Street. Will he want to, <laughs> resignation he, watch. I like that. <laughs> Very he, good. Is he, is, <laughs> well, you know, is he going to want to jump clear of the wreckage? I mean, that's the, that's the big question. Michael Gove is a different kettle of fish. He's interesting. There's sort of a bit of a split emerging between him and Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson thinks we've got to get Brexit right first time because there's only one shot at this. Michael Gove thinks, well, if we mess it up a bit in the negotiation now, at least once we're out yeah. in March 2019, we can improve the deal later on. So there's a bit of a difference in tactics between the two of them. And I think number 10 are trying to drive a wedge between those two. Do they resign and walk out one or two of them? And Boris, you say, getting clear of the wreckage. Or do they actually try and bring down the prime minister and put somebody else in? Well, they might try and do that. And there's, you know, every every other week we get a headline in the Daily Telegraph or the Daily Mail saying Theresa May warned that she's going to be brought down. And mm. basically the, the, the Brexiteers need 48 names um, to trigger a vote of no confidence in the Prime Minister. Um, but if you read the Sunday Times this morning, um, there's a very strong indication from Theresa May's people that if people do try to topple her, she'll fight it out. So the interesting thing there is that it's easy enough to imagine 48 mm. Eurosceptic Conservatives getting the names together to have a vote of no confidence in Theresa May. It's a different thing altogether to expect them to get, I think it's about 160 MPs, to actually win a vote of well, no confidence. So yeah. that's the question. Mrs Thatcher thought that, of course, back in 1990 well, yeah, <laughs> and, and didn't survive. And George, finally, very quickly, I know David Davis is under some intense criticism uh, because he hasn't actually spent much time with Monsieur yeah. Barnier. How true is that? Well, that, that was a story we ran yesterday in the yeah, FT. Exactly. And it's, it's, it's absolutely true. In the in the first six months of 2018, we were just looking at this because it was the 30th of June, he's had three meetings uh, with Mr. Barnier, one in Downing Street, two in Brussels, lasting, according to the Brussels people, about three hours, and to the number 10 people, about four or five hours. But let's say a maximum of four hours in the course of six months. So if you want an idea of how badly the negoti negotiations are going, there you are. Yeah, I sense there is not a great rapport that's developed between Monsieur Barnier and David Davis. Well, they're very different people, aren't they? Mr. Barnier is sort of very rigid, sort of mm. European, steeped in European Commission law. And David Davis is your ultimate political busker, isn't he? He's, he likes to get by on personal relationships and a sort of a, a broad pricey of the arguments rather than necessarily the details. So, yeah, they're, they're chalk and cheese, really. They really are. George Parker, political editor at the Financial Times, thank you very much. Well, George, they're giving his perspective on it. Um, and I wonder, is it time now? Is it time the Eurosceptics stood up and said... To Mrs May, if it's a soft Brexit, we're going to get rid of you. Let me know what you think by calling 0345 6060 You can text to 84850. You can tweet to Farage on LBC at LBC. And, of course, you can watch us on Facebook and comment there too. Let's ask Mark in Palmer's Green. Good morning, Mark. Oh, good morning, Nigel. Um, yeah, this, this has to be our last chance. But do you remember those toys you used to get in the 70s called uh, Weebles Wobbles? But, but they, they don't, don't fall, fall down. down. That's exactly. right. They were great, weren't they? Oh, they were great. But they just never blinking well fell down, did they? 
No. And, and I think <laughs> I think it could be the same with Mrs. May. I mean, I, I was I was I was on Twitter and I saw uh, Andrew Jenkins basically has said her amongst others have written to Theresa May expressing their concerns at the direction of Brexit about it being a soft Brexit, and now she. Mrs. May has basically taken on the language of Subri, etc., mm. saying saying that like Brexit bullies, etc. Uh, yeah, I know, that, you I know, know. I so know. It's, oh, it's a joke, Nigel, isn't it? It's yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The Eurosceptics, the Eurosceptics are the bullies, but the Dominic Greaves and, and the Anna Subris are fine. No, oh, yeah. I, I get that point. Oh, yes. Actually, I tell you what, Mark, it's no such thing as a soft Brexit. It's a betrayal no, Brexit. That's what it is. Absolutely. Because it's absolutely. not delivering what we very clearly voted for. Has the time come, Mark, for her to be got rid of? Oh, oh, oh definitely, definitely, definitely. If, if she's not got rid of, I'll tell you what, at the next general election, they will be wiped out mm. if they rat mm. on Brexit, no. which it looks like they are going to do. And do and, you and think, Mark... That UKIP is being revitalised as well now. Do you, well, well, it may. It may, or there could be a realignment of British politics. Who's to say? But do you think, Absolutely. Mark, do you think, Mark, that the Eurosceptics have got the guts to do that on Friday? Oh, well, I don't. Oh, I, I think mm. it's crossed. That's all I can OK, say. Mark, Fingers thank you. Crossed. Well, folks, I'll tell you what I think. I'll tell you. I'll tell you whether I think they've got the guts to do this. But in a minute, because for now, you're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on OBC, and it is 10.15. The whole cabinet are going to checkers. We're told already by George Parker of the Financial Times that Boris is on resignation watch, and some are saying that this is the perfect setting, checkers, for a sort of Agatha Christie thriller. Uh, who will get bumped off? The body bag, Simon, it's been called. That's the only way some of them are going to leave. I'll tell you what is clear to me, uh, having spoken to some of the most senior Eurosceptics in the Conservative Party in the last 48 hours is that they are becoming genuinely, increasingly worried. Not about us leaving the treaty. And, you know, I've said to you for weeks, months, we are going to leave. I, I think for, you know, the Labour Party to try and, and stop Article 50 expiring on the 29th of March next year would have been they couldn't win the next election, and the same would apply to the Tories. So I still think we're absolutely on course to leave the European treaties. The trouble is... The trouble is that the kind of Brexit the Prime Minister now clearly favours isn't really Brexit at all. So it'll be Brexit in name only. It'll be a sovereign country in name only. And that is what this fight now is all about. Question is, what will the Goves and the Borises and the David Davises do? Will they just go along with a much softer Brexit? And softer Brexit, I'm calling it betrayal Brexit, because frankly, that's what it really would be. Or are they going to stand up and do something? And Bill says to me by text, he says, the EU and their own political class are forcing us into a skinny remain. Not heard that one. Tell me, what happens if Boris and Go resign? Nothing as I understand it. Well, Bill, that depends. You know, do they just resign and, 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 and go off to a, a Mediterranean beach? Well, why bother with the weather here, I suppose? But, you know, do they just take the summer off and disappear? Or do they say, actually, we've got to take the risk. We have to take the risk of getting rid of this Prime Minister, of having a contest to try and get the Brexit process back on track. But of course, as soon as they do that, people will scream, ah, you're opening the door for Jeremy Corbyn. So you could say in some ways in this situation, the Prime Minister holds a better hand of cards than the Eurosceptics. And I actually do believe that to be the truth. Let's see what Charlie from Cardiff thinks. Charlie, good morning. Good morning, Nigel. Good morning. Now, we've spoken I... before, Charlie, and you were a quite a keen Remain supporter, weren't you? That's correct, and I still am. Yep. So, um, I, so you, must I, be, you must be delighted that the Prime Minister's watering Brexit down the way she appears to want to. Um, I'm in two minds on that, but I think the Tories shouldn't get rid of her. Um, a reason being that she had a general election last year, and the main plank of her general election was that she wanted... Um, an increased majority and authority to have a, a hard UK exit. I'll call it a UK exit rather than Brexit, because I think Brexit ignores Northern Ireland, because, of course, with the United Kingdom... OK, you know, I get that, I get that, yeah. Yep. Right. So, so <laughs> um, she wanted a hard UK exit. She was denied her majority. The people spoke and said they didn't ah. want a U hard UK exit, and that was an opinion after 
the referendum. So therefore, that is a more updated opinion. But Charlie, uh, let me update you on that opinion, because actually the Labour Party in the general election said we'd be leaving the European Union and leaving the single market. So you could argue that actually 85% of the electorate in that June 17 election voted to leave the single market. The Tories and Labour... Um OK, I uh, uh, split on, on, on the EU. But that's the what the... Yeah, no, no, hang, hang on, Charlie. Hang on, yeah. Charlie. You know, the point is they may be split on it, but that is very clearly what their manifestos said and what their leaders said in their launches. Yeah. I mean, you could take the, the opposite view and say only 50... At, at most, 15% voted for UKIP, Liberal Democrats, Green, the parties that had a clear view on Europe. Therefore, they aren't really interested in Europe. It's way down their agenda. It's important to you and, and I... But to the majority of public, it's just another issue. But, and but, but the point, Charlie, I'm arguing with you is, yeah. is to me, to me, you know, if we were to stay in, if, if Mrs May wants us to stay in a single market for goods, which, of course, yeah. is, would be massively to the benefit of the German car manufacturers and the French winemakers, particularly if we don't get something back on services in return. But if she wants to do that, my argument, Charlie, is that goes against the referendum result and against the way most people voted in the general election. I still disagree with you on the general election. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you the position I was in. Right. Labour said they were pro-EU, but the only way that people like me could help deny um, May her majority was by, by supporting well, uh, parties other than the Tories. Now, where I live, Liberal Democrats, which I normally support, had no chance. Do you think, Charlie, if we... If, if, ever, I put an X against a Labour candidate. Now, if, I know five other people in the constituency who don't normally vote Labour or never have done. Charlie, have we, if we'd had proportional representation... As opposed to voting Labour, how would you have voted? Liberal Democrat first, Plaid yes. Cymru second. No, Green second, Plaid Cymru third, but I would have voted Labour before Conservative. Yeah, but, I mean, here's the point, isn't it? Different, with a different electorate. Look, I take your point that not everybody who voted Labour and not everybody who voted Conservative believed in leaving the single market. I do understand that, Charlie. I do take that point. But I, I really do think that if we stay part of a single market on goods, that is a betrayal of how we voted. Charlie, finally, can I just ask you, yep. do, do you think, as I do, that regardless of whatever the deal may be, that we are on track to leave at 11pm on March 29th next year? Do you know, I honestly don't know where that one, because poor old May, she's in a really difficult position, and, 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 and you <laughs> and I should have put her there. <laughs> well, there you are. <laughs> well, she or Corbyn, I mean, you're, you've been a party leader, so you know that the, the, their dilemma. Yeah. Um, their dilemma is, is their party going to come first? If, it's no good if their party splits and they don't get power, they can't do anything. So her, she's got to keep the party together, and as soon as Corbyn or um, May effectively blink and go clearly in one direction or the other, they're going to lose sufficient support to let the other lot in. Mm. And so I don't know. No, I don't, no, I don't know well, do you know what? Do, do you know what? There could be dramas that come as that October deadline approaches that neither Charlie, you or I can see. I just think that from a Labour Party perspective, if they were to try and delay... Uh, Article 50, they would lose a lot of votes. Charlie, I thank you as ever for your call. Tina on Facebook says, the EU have not been prepared to negotiate. It has been a one-sided surrender. What that nice Monsieur Barney, Tina, and the even more charming Giva Hofstadt, who I've got to face tomorrow evening at five o'clock in the European Parliament in Strasbourg after Belgium beat us 1-0. I'm not looking forward to that very much, I can tell you. And Ian says on Facebook, I have a feeling that our leaders are having their strings pulled by the EU. What are you saying, Ian, that we haven't got great leadership in this country? Well, isn't it odd that the Prime Minister, Mrs May, wrote an article that was published in today's Sunday Telegraph. I'm planning for a brighter future after Brexit. I mean, maybe it's going to be a hit record at some point with that title. I've no idea. But amazing that the Prime Minister writes about this and that virtually nobody is talking about it at all because it is bland beyond all description. Need I say more? What does Roy from Croydon make of it all? Morning, Roy. Yeah, I think um, we're heading towards Bre uh, Brian o Nigel. Brian o. Brexit in name only. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean... Um, she never denied it, Mrs May, but her Florence speech was apparently written by the EU. 
And she's never, ever denied that. Well... This uh, Thursday, she's It wasn't written by them, Roy. It wasn't written by them, but, but she consulted them on the content. Yes. they like going to the headmaster, really, isn't it? You know, and say, I've got to give a speech on prize giving day. Is this OK? And this Thursday, she's going to Berlin to meet Mrs Merkel. Now, yet again, is that to pick up the white paper that the EU have translated for? <laughs> <laughs> do, you know, do you know, Roy, do you know, Roy, if, if, if you'd said something like that to me, yeah. A few years ago, I'd have said, cool, that Roy from Croydon, he's a ranting conspiracy theorist. But actually, <laughs> I completely understand what you're... It's almost as if she's taking instructions, isn't it? It is, really. I mean, in Spain, as you know, at the football matches, they, they wave, wave white handkerchiefs when they're going to surrender. And Mrs May seems to produce white papers. <laughs> <laughs> one, one thing I want to put to you, Nigel... Very good. Yeah, go on. Um... <sighs> All right, ignore the single market. This uh, customs union, to, to sort the island issue out, yeah. could we not say to the EU, right, we're not accepting free movement of people, uh, we don't want your rules and regulations, but to be an associate member of the customs union, we'll give you £2 billion a year. Now, if they turn around and say, oh, you know, that's uh, um, having your cake and eat it, hang on a minute, no other country, well, a lot of these smaller countries are not paying any coppers into the EU. No. So for us to make a one-off offer, just to have a, an associate member of the customs union and pay off, pay a one-off fee per year, surely she could square that. I'm sure what, she could negotiate that. What, just to satisfy the Irish border issue? Yes, yeah. And that f helps, you know, um, goods flow and all the other bits and pieces. Surely that, that should be part of a negotiating uh, ploy. Well, I don't know what a negotiating ploy is, Roy. Oh, uh, Roy. Uh, other than to soften, 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 concede, 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 and it really isn't good enough. Roy, I thank you. Chris says, if Brexit is betrayed, the Tories won't see number 10 for a generation. Now, Chris, I think you're right. I think this has the potential to do massive damage to the Conservative Party. I mean, look, personally, folks, I hope that we get a complete realignment of British politics. I think the whole thing is an absolute joke as it is. But listen, you know, one thing about Mrs May that you do have to say is, my gosh, she's resilient, isn't she? I mean, she's still there. Despite all the difficulties, she's still there. I want to hear from some of you who think, and Charlie in Cardiff wants her to stay on as PM. Uh, I, I think many of us uh, who believe in Brexit think she's now proven beyond doubt that she's the wrong person to lead us through this process. But please, if you think she's actually doing rather a good job in difficult circumstances, let me know on 0345 6060 973. You're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show, exclusive in LBC. It's now 10.30. As Friday approaches and the whole cabinet go to Chequers to meet in leafy Buckinghamshire, we will be speculating. Are the Brexiteers, will they stand up? force the Prime Minister to change direction? Will they threaten to get rid of her? Or actually, does she now really hold the cards? But before that, let's go to Lancashire, uh, where the scene is far from leafy. And let's join Lizzie Longley, LBC's reporter at Winter Hill, outside Bolton. Lizzie, good morning. Morning, Nigel. Well, there's still a lot of smoke here on Winter Hill, but it's not quite as thick as it was a few hours ago. We're on to day three of this particular blaze, which has spread over nearly two square miles. It was once two separate fires, but they've merged into one. This is a huge operation, 22 fire engines, 30 crews. You can probably hear the helicopters flying overhead to collect reservoir water. Uh, Mountain Rescue are here dropping off water for crews too. It's a rapidly developing aggressive fire and Ben Norman is operations commander from Lancashire Fire and Rescue. It's not only a fire on the surface, but we've got a fire beneath the surface in the peat type soil. So it's a very significant incident that we'd expect to be at this scale at least for the next few days, if not a significant incident taking us beyond that. That's, uh, that's the situation, Lizzie, in Bolton. What's happening at Saddleworth? Is that fire still burning as well? So at Saddleworth, it's the same kind of situation. Sorry, I'm very near at anyone. I can hear. Now onto its seventh day, and uh, Manchester Fire and Rescue are putting all of their efforts into it. They've had 28 fire engines tackling the moorland fires, 120 personnel spread across uh, Tame Side and this fire here on Windale. So under loads of pressure, and it doesn't look like any of these fires are going to go away until the weather improves. And we haven't got any rain forecasted for you know for at least a week. And presumably, Lizzie, the stronger the wind, the more dangerous these fires become. Exactly. The windier it gets, we see these, this, the, the massive 
clouds of smoke just traveling across uh, across Lancashire. You can see this from miles away when I was still driving towards uh, uh, Winter Hill. I, I, I could I could see it from, from very far away when I was still on the motorway. And, uh, and of course as well, uh, with Winter Hill in particular, uh, it's, it, it's home to one of the most important transmitters in the UK, covering around 7 million people. Wow. It's very, very close to the fire. So if it does become engulfed in the flames, that will obviously create huge problems for uh, broadcasting in the region. Lizzie, thank you. Stay safe. Stay safe. And we'll keep with that story. Thank you. Well, that was rather dramatic coverage with helicopters and goodness knows what. And that was Winter Hill, just outside Bolton. And the point I think the chief fire officer was making was these fires are not just on the surface. These moors are peat. So it's kind of burning down underground as well. Unless it rains, I guess that could go on for a very, very long time. We'll talk to John Ketley at half past 11 about what the prospects for rain are. I guess on Twitter. I've been saying privately for weeks that Theresa May will call the bluff of her backbench Brexiteers. Now's the time for them. Party or country, we're watching. Well, Mr Hill, I asked myself that question back at the time of the Maastricht Treaty when I was convinced that Bill Cash and the gang would stop John Major in his tracks uh, and ultimately Major used a confidence motion and they backed the Prime Minister and the Maastricht Treaty went through, and it was that that actually got me into alternative politics and getting involved, helping to form a brand new political party. And it is one of those moments. You know, we are very, very close to one of those moments where, as you say, they're going to have to make a decision, country or party. And all the pleas will be there for people to get loyally behind the Prime Minister, regardless how soft she makes this Brexit, how much of a betrayal it's seen to millions. The argument will be to get behind her, otherwise Mr Corbyn will get in. It's the usual tribal argument we get uh, in a country uh, where, frankly, good political debate and thought is paralysed, in my opinion, by a first-past-the-post electoral system that is completely out of date. That's how I feel about it. Billy is a first-time caller to LBC, and he lives in Scotland in... Is it Trennant, Billy, where you are? Um, Trennant, my Nigel. Tr oh. OK, good morning. Good morning. Yourself? How are you doing yourself? Well, I'm all right. I mean, I, I just, you know... <sighs> Billy, I, I still believe that we will leave the European treaties, and that's a major historical achievement, but I just fear that we're being taken to a place where we won't be able to take any of the benefits. Yeah, that's yeah, that's the same. But this, I believe this all stems from Theresa May getting elected in the first place to be Prime Minister. That should never have been allowed a Remainer Prime Minister and, and a Brexit, which was going to be leading to a Brexit government. It should never have been allowed from start to finish. It should have been Ni Michael Gove. I know he's no perfect, but it should have been him or the other lady that was there at the time. Andrea Leadsom, yeah. But she yeah, sort of... One of those. Yeah, I mean, Andrea Leadsom had never really been absolutely in the forefront of the of the sort of full media spotlight and she had a sort of one weekend of being roughed up with the newspapers and thought well, enough's enough mind you billy i've been through it i can't blame her no i think you're right i think someone like gove who actually believed in the thing and had, and had, and had risked his entire career on principle would have been better and it was funny billy you know i remember paxman interviewing mrs may and sort of saying you know do you now believe in brexit and there was no answer and then ian dale um, on LBC here, saying to her, well, if there was another referendum now, how would you vote? And she wouldn't answer. So the problem is, Billy, not just that she was a Remainer at the time she became Prime Minister, but she still, today, doesn't really believe in Brexit, does she? No, and that's the thing. I believe a lot of these Conservatives and just general British politicians in general get a lot of funding from the EU, and that's why I think that they're trying to put every single break on hold. Jeremy Corbyn was another one. Before you and you kiss them things, him and Dennis Skinner were one of the most anti EU politicians in Britain. And as soon as he got elected as Labour leader, he changed his opinion. Yeah. So I think he, he's like, he's just a turncoat. So it's to me, I hate to say it, but we need someone like Winston Churchill, like someone to save us from this whole mess. Well. America's not backing us up. And, and so, 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 Billy, who is the Churchill of our times? That's a thing. God knows. <laughs> no, well, I think that's right. I mean, Billy, do you think it's worth... You clearly believe in the Brexit cause. Do you think it's worth risking a Corbyn government by toppling May and trying to get a leader that believes in Brexit? Um, I, it's hard, because I don't believe in Labour at all. 
<laughs> it's, yeah, I, but it's also it's tough for the Tories, Billy, because if they do topple her, by the time they've had it now, they would have to speed up the election process, get it done over the summer, otherwise there'd be no negotiating time left before the October deadline at all. Not easy, yeah. is it? No. no Not I, easy. But Theresa May was one of the stupidest... She, I'd say she's one of the worst Prime Ministers since um, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, I'd say. So I spoke, Billy, I spoke on the phone to um, a Tory grandee, um, been a cabinet minister for many, many years, getting and getting on advanced age, so he's been part of the Tory party for, you know, basically 70 years. And I said to him on the phone, I said, you know what? She must be the worst prime minister in our lifetimes. He said, steady on, old boy. He said, there's a bit of competition. And then he said, I agree with you. Billy, she's hopeless. Thank you. Let's go to Jim in Dartford. Jim, good morning. Good morning, Nigel. So, I is think... she... I mean, do you have a sneaking regard for this prime minister? Yes. With reservations, I understand she takes her time, tries to get things right. Um, if she had issued the white paper sooner, that gives the Remainers, Remoners, what you like to call them, the EU, time to pour it over, pull it apart, and yeah. do whatever. At the moment, at the moment, all they're doing is say, "Come on, we want the white paper. We want the white paper." And if we leave it to the last minute which is the, the EU kind of thing, that gives them less time to pull over and, and faff about with the negotiations. Well, from a, tacti- from a tactical point of view, Jim, that may, very, that may very well be right. Mm-hmm. But what about in terms of strategy? What about in terms of principle? What about in terms of where she's taking the whole direction of Brexit? I mean, if, if she wants us to be in a customs partnership and part of a single market in goods. I mean, is that Brexit, Jim? Uh, no. As, as, but now that we've got March 29th next year in place, if we don't get the deal that we want, then we go, we're out. That's the way I see it. And that's where my reservations are, is whether how, how much of a remainder she is. But she has said we are leaving. We're leaving the customs unit, blah de blah de blah. Mm. So that's where the reservations come in. That's what she said. And it depends on whether um, you believe in her convictions. And when she says she's going to do something, <coughs> that's what she's going to do. Do you think she'll stay on? Another point. Do you think, Jim, she'll point. stay on as Prime Minister? If, well, she can stand it so far. I don't see why not. Mm. What's she got to lose? And will the others want a knife her, or is it just too dangerous for them? Well, we don't know what goes on behind cl- closed doors. So, My actual thoughts are that this actually could have been David Davis's idea about string it, or leaving it to the last moment. Uh-huh. It sounds more likely one of his ideas than hers. That, no, that, that, that may well be true. And I, and I haven't, Jim, been critical over uh, the delay of the white paper. My worry is what's in the blooming thing. And I'm told that dealing with free movement of people won't even feature. That's what I'm hacked off about. Jim, I thank you. You're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show, exclusive on LBC, and it's now 10.45. Will there be great drama at Chequers on Friday as the Prime Minister summons the entire Cabinet just after two years after we voted to leave the European Union to decide what the policy is? Wow, that's decisive, isn't it? That really is showing the world that we mean business. Conservatives equal weak and floppy, I get by SMS. Nigel, I predict that we will just about achieve Brexit, but it will be more of a nose over the finishing line than a resounding victory. Yep, well, I very much agree with that. Uh, We will then have years of different governments slowly having to improve upon it, and all because of May's government being so weak and not having a clue how to negotiate. Andy from Feltham, that completely, 100% sums up my position on this. That's exactly how I feel about this. Let's ask Sonny, a first-time caller to the show from Dublin. Sonny, good morning. How are you, Nigel? Listen, is uh, you know, I'm very, very uh, g- uh, glad to be speaking uh, to you. I've been listening to you for over um, two years now. Terrific. And, and I really do support uh, Brexit. I hope that it, uh, it works out. But why do you think... Um, 
Theresa May is hopeless and useless and the whole thing, you'll be talking about her. Why do you think so? Because, Sonny, all right, well, you asked me that. Number one, she's made so many concessions to Mr Barnier. She's allowed herself to be boxed in. I mean, Barnier has almost got her in checkmate in terms of us having now to sign up uh, to being part of a single market in goods and a commitment to a customs union. Sonny, I, you know, too many concessions and a lack of genuine conviction and courage. They're the two reasons that I, I've thought all the way through she was the wrong leader. Now, others say, actually, you know, she's done a good job in difficult circumstances. But I actually, I actually agree with you. She's the long lead, uh, wrong leader in this circumstance. Now, is she hopeless? Is she, you know, not a leader? The whole thing you've been saying about her, you know, for the previous time I've been listening to you. No, she's not. She, 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 you know, she's a good lady. I mean, she's, you know, a good leader. But the problem she has is that she has a divided cabinet. She has a divided parliament. She has a divided country. You know, and she doesn't have a majority as well. You have to also remember that. Well, she's she got the S. So she's, she she, she's got the she's got the DUP there supporting her. No, but what I'm saying is, you know, she doesn't have a majority in her in her, in the parliament in, in the in the parliament, so she can't really, you know, um, put through, you know, what she wants to do. But I'm actually glad, actually, I'm actually glad that she doesn't have a majority because I believe that Mrs. May, she had a majority. She has her way. She will keep Britain to European Union, but um, because she doesn't have a majority, that is why she's you know con uh, uh, you know getting advice from different people. But you also have to know that she's you know she's uh, has like I said divided uh, um, cabinet, and there is no way you know she can do things you know that she wants she wants to do on her own without actually getting the support. Well, Sonny, the one thing I'm certain of, if she had a whacking great big majority, it'd be, it would probably be an even softer Brexit, because that's what she believes in. Sonny, I understand the point about divided cabinets, divided countries, and all the rest of it, and things are very difficult. But that is the moment that somebody needs to strike out, to be bold, and to say, this is the way forward, this is where we're going. And, you know, I made the point, Sonny, that she's written a piece in today's Sunday Telegraph. The Prime Minister has written a piece in the Sunday Telegraph that virtually no one's commenting on. It's so bland, it's so dull, and even the Sunday Telegraph themselves haven't flagged on the front page the fact the Prime Minister's written for them. Sonny, uh, I don't doubt she's a nice lady, but I don't see her as a leader. I thank you very much indeed for your call. I was waiting for this Rob on Twitter. She needs to be ousted and Mog put in charge. Well, there are many that think that, and certainly quite a lot who follow this show that feel that way. Uh, Mick is calling from Bath. Mick, good morning. Uh, good morning, Nigel. I'm one of the, I speak as one of the 17.4 million sick people yes. who voted uh, two years ago. And I, I, you know, all this mess that was happening uh, with Boris and Gove, and then she came in and I, my heart sank. And I thought, my God, we've got a civil servant running this show. Mm. And I, then my heart lifted and I felt very happy after hearing the Lancaster House speech. And between then and I the was Mick, Mick, I was cheering the Lancaster House speech. Yeah. I don't think you were... Then we were all yelling from the rooftops. And then what happened between that and the Florence speech, why she had to go to Florence to deliver it, goodness knows, um, with <laughs> a total sea change. And the woman just changed. It, just, it, it seems that the fudge factory has worked, and then she's picked up a franchise on it. So what happens, Mick? Put yourself in the position of a David Davis, a Michael Gover, Boris. You believe in Brexit. You think it's the right thing for the country. You know it's not easy, but it's the right thing for the country. What do you do at Chequers on Friday? I would uh, resign. I, I think it's a matter of I think it's a matter of courage. Yep. I think it's a matter of principle, and quite quite honestly, throw it to the nation. And if you get Corbyn in, see what happens then. I would rather have uh, a, another government, and then we could fight from a from a different baseline and get this through. Because I I think she would just completely fudge this. I'm I'm absolutely. I, I started off getting depressed about it, Nigel, mm. and now I'm really angry because I, I see signs on the road scribbled around here around uh, Bath where I live yeah. uh, in yellow paint and you've seen them all out in the streets with the berets and things mm. and it's 
stop Brexit. Stop well, Brexit. you see, to the me, thing is, Mick, the thing me, is, Mick. Let me just finish this, Nigel. Is, to me, that says stop democracy. Yes, but the point is, Mick, and Charles Moore made this point in the Telegraph and, and, and that article's in the Sun on Sunday today. Charles Moore made this point that actually the reason you've got all this going on is because she has created an enormous level of doubt, a vacuum, into which uh, those that wish us not to Brexit have had an opportunity to get their voice heard. We have just had pathetic leadership. Mick, I thank you. Um, I've got a call from Madeira. Jules is a first-time caller from Madeira. Good morning. Good morning, Nigel. A pleasure to speak to you. Pleasure to speak to you. Now, is it hotter in London than Madeira today? I'm not. It probably um, is. I think it is, actually, from what I hear. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so, what do you make of Chequers coming up on Friday? What should the Eurosceptics do? Back the Prime Minister or threaten to get rid of her? Uh, threaten to get rid of her, I think, to be honest. Um, but from what I'm reading in the papers while I've been over here enjoying the sunshine, although I think you have been in the UK as well, yeah. um, I understand that there's a chance that um, the EU may actually vote against what she's going to put on the table anyway. So if that's going to be the case, why are we wasting time discussing what we're discussing this coming Friday? Shouldn't we be making plans for a no deal? Jules, we absolutely should be making plans for a no deal. And by the way, there's no such thing as a no deal. There is something called the World Trade Organization that sets up the rules for international trade, which interestingly, Jules, given what uh, Airbus was saying the other week, uh, means that all aerospace goods are exempt of tariffs, a point that seemed to miss uh, many of the press here. No, Jules, we should be preparing for a deal on WTO rules and perhaps with some other features uh, that we could add as well. I mean, we could say, do you know what? We are going to allow you to continue to sell your goods in this country. We'll set up no border posts. We'll charge you no tariffs. It'll mean no problem at the Irish border and no queues in Dover. We could do that, Jules. And let's hope she gets on and does that. But I don't think that's going to be the case, sadly. Nor do I. No, nor do I. Do you think the Eurosceptics will have the guts to act? I'd like to think so. But uh, who knows? Uh, anything's possible in politics, isn't it, really? Jules, I, I, I said, I, I've, I've sort of been keeping my opinion back for over the course of the last hour. Uh, but I think there'll be all sorts of sound and noise at Chequers on Friday. There may be a resignation or two, uh, but I do not think that they will dare cobble together enough names to force, if they can, a leadership challenge. I just don't think they'll take the risk. They think it'll do too much damage to the party and risk destabilisation and a Corbyn general election. Jules, they may wield the knife, but they won't use it. That's my view. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you. Speaking to you. Great to hear from you. Thank you very much indeed. I've got time for one last quick call. Anthony is calling from Staines. Good morning, Anthony. Oh, good morning, Nigel. Hello there again. Hi. Uh, May to stay, no question. That's my first point. There's okay. absolutely no, no re resignation that she's doing absolutely fine. The economy is up uh, and Brexit is on course. Parliament, you know, big majority. All the well, uh, signposts are there. Yeah, but she hasn't got a bit. I mean, she, I mean yeah, I'm, I'm, look, the economy is doing OK. That's certainly true. <laughs> uh, she's a resilient woman uh, who, has, who has dug in well. Uh, she's managed to stay in post with a divided cabinet and party. I agree with all of those things, Anthony. But Brexit is an historic opportunity. Is this leader going to grab it? I think she is, because I think that she can, uh, she can draw on the economy, the good signs we see in the economy, and what I think she needs to do at Chequers is to get the old anti-aircraft gun out, be a bit of a Kim, and get rid of some of those deadwood in her cabinet. And, uh, and who, who would you define as the deadwood, Anthony? David Davis, no question. Ah, so you, want to, you wanted to get rid of the Eurosceptics? No, I think she can shuffle the Eurosceptics. She needs to keep Gove on side. Boris, certainly. They, must, they are definitely uh, key players. But I think she has to sacrifice one Eurosceptic, and that is Davis. Right. Well, we'll see. We'll see. Maybe if Davis feels uncomfortable, he'll sacrifice himself and walk away. I do not know. Anthony, thank you for your call. Thank you, all of you, for your calls. It'll be a lot of speculation leading up to Checkers on Friday. My guess is 
She will emerge from it, still very much as Prime Minister. We may see a resignation, but that'll be about it. Now, Theresa May has dismissed questions over a reported rift with Defence Secretary Gavin Williamson about military spending. Pressed over the Cabinet row, the Prime Minister instead said the UK has the biggest defence budget in Europe, so that's all right then. With a major NATO summit coming up on the 11th of July with Trump over in town, let me ask, does defence matter to you as an issue? And if you think, yep, it's important, we've got to stay as a tier one military power, call me on 0345 6060 If you think it's a waste of money, who's the enemy? Nothing to worry about. Text to 84850. Or maybe you think in Brexit Britain, we need our standing in the world to rise, in which case tweet using the hashtag Farage and LBC at LBC. And of course, watch us on Facebook and comment there too. <laughs>